This is White Coat Investor Podcast number 126, Reducing Investment Taxes with Phil DeMuth. Thanks so much for what you do. I think you're probably on your way into work or you're out walking around the neighborhood with the dog or maybe you're on your way home after a difficult shift or a difficult day in clinic. And if nobody told you thanks today, let me be the first. Be sure you check out our YouTube channel. You can find that at youtube.com slash the white coat investor. If you like the video format, it's a great one and we're trying to boost the amount of content we put on there every month. We're going to try to put a little bit more kind of short form content that's just three to five minutes long rather than some of the longer stuff we put up in the past, but be sure to check that out. You can also join the White Coat Investor private Facebook group. That's found at www.facebook.com slash groups slash White Coat Investors. Because remember, you are the White Coat Investors, not me. Uh, I suppose I'm one as well, but the whole point of calling this whole enterprise the White Coat Investor was not that I was the White Coat Investor, but that you are the White Coat Investors. Our quote of the day today comes from Peter Lynch, who said, I can't recall ever once having seen the name of a market timer on Forbes' annual list of the richest people in the world. If it were truly possible to predict corrections, you'd think somebody would have made billions by doing it. I think that's absolutely true. That's a great quote from Peter Lynch reminding us of just how difficult it is to time the market. Cindy here, the White Coat Investor Business Manager, to introduce this episode's sponsor. Contract Diagnostics is a long-term advertiser with us here at White Coat Investor. In fact, they've been partnering with White Coat Investor longer than I've been here working with Jim. Jim loves this company as they've helped hundreds of White Coat Investor readers and listeners get a fair shake when it comes to reviewing and understanding their employment contracts. It's 100% what they do there. All contracts are reviewed by an in-house attorney and presented in a simplified way back to you. Using custom documentation, compensation data, and times from 6 a.m. to 8 p.m., they make it easy for you. All packages are flat price, so you know what you will pay up front. Residents and fellows can even make interest-free payments over time. They have a new compensation review offering coming soon for those of you happy at your positions as well. So look them up at contractdiagnostics.com or 888-574-5526. That's contractdiagnostics.com or 888-574-5526. We have a guest today, Phil DeMuth, who will also be speaking at the 2020 Physician Wellness and Financial Literacy Conference in March in Las Vegas. Phil is the author of 11 books, I believe, although I had a hard time counting them, there were so many, primarily about investing, including The Overtaxed Investor and The Affluent Investor, which I've reviewed on the blog over the years. He is the Managing Director of Conservative Wealth Management. He has a Master's in Communication and a PhD in Clinical Psychology. He has described himself in emails to me as your slavish follower and devoted fan. And I admit, I am a sucker for his highly skilled flattery. <laughs> so here he is. Welcome to the White Coat Investor Podcast, Phil. Dr. Jim, thanks so much for having me. It's great to be here. You know, I really wanted to focus in today on taxes, especially investment-related taxes. In fact, that's what I titled this podcast. But before we get into that, something I do with all my guests, I wanted listeners to get to know you a little bit. So can you tell us a bit about your background, kind of what your upbringing was like, your education, and your career? Sure. Uh, well, you know, my superhero origin story is uh, it's not as good as Batman or Superman, but for what it's worth, I grew up in the Midwest in the suburbs of Chicago. I ended up at the University of California at Santa Barbara, and finally I uh, took up my PhD in clinical psychology. So I, I started my career as a psychologist, and the most relevant thing here for your listeners is that for about 10 years, I was with the Division of Behavioral Medicine at the Mount Sinai Medical Center in Cleveland, Ohio. So I was actually a wearer of a white coat. And not only that, it I understand that there's a pecking order of white coats in, within a hospital, or at least there was back then. And I've got to wear the same white coat, probably by mistake at the laundry department, that the actual physicians got to wear. So I've had I had the early experience of being sort of a, a fake physician, but actually a, just a clinical psychologist uh, working in a hospital setting and got to know a lot of doctors in that context. You know, it's interesting about the white coats in some facilities. Uh, none of the doctors wear white coats and everybody else seems to. So it definitely gets confused. <laughs> Although traditionally there's a hierarchy and it's all about the length of your coat. You know, you get a really short one when you're a medical student, then you become a resident. It's a little longer and the attendings have longer ones. But I think that's much more common on the East Coast than it is out where I'm at. Fascinating. 
Well, I, eventually I got out of the psychology gigs. I wanted to write. And I ended up in Los Angeles. My good friend there, Ben Stein, we used to have lunch all the time and talk about the stock market ad nauseum. And finally, Ben said, we should write this stuff up because it's good enough to be published. Just our lunch table conversation, he said. So uh, I said, great, but uh, I didn't know anybody in the publishing world. So he just sent off an email. And in 10 minutes later, he had a book contract. So we were off to the races with it. It was that quick, huh? In this case, it was very, uh, it, it went fast, which is, I guess, what happens when you've got a sort of a celebrity you're working with. Then I thought, well, you know, I'm writing these books, you know, it's really for my own benefit, but it would be just as easy, he said to himself, to just take other people along on the same investment journey that I'm on. So I'll just hang out a shingle as an investment advisor since I'm already doing everything, I thought. And so I started that as well. And I found there's actually a little more to it than just uh, hanging out a shingle. There's, it's an SEC regulated business, so there's lots of hoops to jump through. But it's, uh, but it's gone well. It's been a lot of fun. So, was your background kind of uh, relatively impoverished or middle class or fairly well to do? And how did that affect your views on money as you grew up? Well, I grew up in the, in the northern suburbs of Chicago, which today would probably be considered uh, well-to-do. And e even back then, although to tell you the truth, the suburb I grew up in is a lot nicer looking today than when I grew up. I mean, when I grew up, there wasn't, people didn't have color TV, they didn't have air conditioning, you know, it was a sort of a log cabin. But I'm from a relatively uh, upper middle class background, you might say. You know, I had an, my first job, summer job, was working on LaSalle Street in Chicago as a messenger. I was just carrying briefcases full of securities up and down the street from one firm to another. And it occurred to me recently that what I probably should have done is just taken those suitcases full of securities, got on a plane and moved to Uruguay and uh, set up a mountain retreat there. But I, I wasn't smart enough to be a, a financial criminal mastermind at the time. So uh, I didn't do that and just uh, ended up uh, going along. But I, I think it, it's given me a certain level of comfort probably dealing with upper income individuals that I might not have had if I came from a different socioeconomic background. Now, you've written a bunch of books. How, how many is it exactly? Is it nine or 11 or how many? Well, you know, I don't actually know. I think I think it might be 11 by now. <laughs> uh, a, a, a couple of them are books on politics from sort of a right wing point of view. And in my case, probably more of a libertarian point of view that Ben suggested that I was happy to uh, piggyback on with. But the rest were really on different topics in finance that struck my fancy along the way. So which one of these books is your favorite? Which one sells the best? And which one do you think is the most important? <laughs> well, all of them, of course. But my favorite is whatever I'm working on at the time. So lately, I've just been obsessed with taxes. I pick some topic that's an area that I feel I should know more about, and I use it as an excuse to do a deep dive and learn everything that I feel I ought to know as a financial advisor working with people. So the other books are on the shelf, and I, I use them as references. But what I'm learning about now is always the most interesting the ones that have sold the best, I think the political books have probably sold better. I don't know why. Just I guess there's sort of more interest in that general area. Although our first book that we wrote together spent uh, some time at number four on Amazon, which is a pretty high ranking in the Amazon world, until it got knocked off by a book about some boy wizard that was doing well. <laughs> So that was, the, that was the end of that. It was that's, down that's a bit of a sense. claim to fame, isn't it? You know, we got creamed by Harry Potter, you know? Yeah, that's, uh, that's what happened. But uh, it would have happened one way or another anyway. So if you look back at that body of work you produced, which, which one of those books do you think is the most important? Well, I think the one that summarizes everything the best is probably The Affluent Investor. That's sort of a more general everything I know book in, you know, 150 pages. But looking back, I think that some of the other books have been have held up pretty well. Even the book on retirement planning, you know, it was, it was the first book, as a book at least, to talk about sequence of return risk. The portfolio, it suggested, was a very uh, successful 
portfolio, it turned out for retirees to own. And it had different rules for drawing down the portfolio that also proved to be quite good. So even though it was written in you know 2005, I'm surprised at how well it's all held up. All right. Let's talk a little bit about doctors, since most of our audience is doctors and similar high-income professionals. A lot of your clients are doctors. What do you think is unique about the financial life of a doctor? Well, it's a, uh, it's a tremendous puzzle, this whole thing with physicians, because supposedly, in theory, doctors should be fantastic investors. In, in theory, there should be no white coat investor website because they're they should never have gotten into any trouble in the first place because they're super smart. They know how to make cost benefit decisions. They know how to do risk analysis. They know how to live with consequences. They've got all the right skills to be great investors. But then in practice, what you find is that a lot of them are lousy investors. So this is one of the great mysteries before us. I suspect that it has to do just with the fact that doctors tend to be extremely smart. And that means that they can also be somewhat uh, easily bored and restless. And then they look to the financial world. They look to Jim Cramer. They look to CNBC as being a source of uh, infotainment and investotainment. And then so all of a sudden, they've entered this whole area through the wrong door. They've entered it through the casino door. And it's just, uh, it's a terrible approach. And you can lose a lot of money or spend a long time before you find a way to make a lot of money when you start out that way. So given those habits of doctors and those natural inclinations, do you think it's reasonable for any doctor to be a do-it-yourself investor? And if so, what percentage of them do you think can do it well enough that they should not hire a financial planner and or an investment manager? Again, it's, it's a very tough call because in theory, especially on the uh, investing side, they can do it very easily. Every doctor could buy a Vanguard target date fund targeted for the year they plan to retire, and that could take care of their entire investment life up to a point anyway. So they could do great doing it. And yet, I'm aware that Dr. Bill Bernstein, who I, uh, I think very highly of, he thinks that doctors, you know, maybe only one or two percent could do it because of just their temperamental issues with it all. So, but that's not to say that I have a great endorsement for the profession of uh, registered investment advisors or financial planners. You know, it took me years to find somebody to do a succession planning with with my business. They said, "Oh, just go to a conference, have drinks with somebody, and just." You know, your succession plan will be taken care of. It took me seven years to find somebody that I felt comfortable handing my clients affairs over to if and when I get hit by a bus or retire. So I think most financial advisors, they charge too much. They don't really deliver a lot for what they do charge. So I think that you have to choose somebody very carefully uh, in that regard. And then it's also just a, a question of, you know, do I want to spend a lot of my time learning how to manage money when my alternative use is being a physician is very highly paid? So it's a it's a tough trade off. And there's a there's a real opportunity cost involved. I think there's an easy answer there. Yeah, there's definitely a balance for sure. Some people do very well. But part of the difficulty, I think, is even a doctor that's relatively highly paid looks at what they're paying for investment management, financial planning, et cetera, and realizes that that is the highest paid use of their time. You know, yeah, it may be the equivalent of four or $500 an hour or $1,000 an hour for them to learn how to do this stuff themselves. And I, I think that provides a lot of mo this pretty significant motivation. As I think one of my readers said, you know, it's the best paid hobby out there. And if you hate it, it's the best paid chore out there. You know, that it's just so expensive to get that it's almost like you feel like you have to learn it. But obviously, some people still choose to, you know, to outsource that part of their life. Right. That's absolutely correct. It, it could be a very highly paid hobby if you have the temperament to be disciplined about it. If you don't have the temperament, the problem is, you know, your college buddy comes to visit with his wife and she's driving a Mercedes and your wife's driving an old Honda. And then they leave and your wife says to you, you know, 
I hear that he's been investing in marijuana stocks and he's really making a lot of money. Now, why aren't we doing that? So you've got to be able to stand up to these kinds of uh, situations when you see other people who are idiots doing better than you are. (laughs) All right. So you're given one of our keynote talks at the White Coat Investor Conference next March. What should people expect to hear from you there? Well, you're not going to like this, but basically what I'm going to be telling your audience is that they are ducks in a shooting gallery. These people are high income. Their only real tax shelter is their retirement plan, which is another golden goose. And they're just moving along. And the IRS just sees people like this. Congress sees people like this. And they just pick them off one by one. They are the most vulnerable people in terms of taxes. You're in a very tough spot. So they've got to defend themselves as as best they can. And I see you also put me on a college funding panel. So I've been doing some research on that, and I think I have a couple of ideas there that I haven't seen commonly discussed in terms of ways of optimizing paying for college. So that I think it's going to be very, very interesting. I'm thrilled that you invited me. Yeah, we're excited to have you. It's going to be a great conference. We are all kinds of people. For those who are just now hearing about this. I'm very sorry. It sold out in 22 hours back in July. There is a waiting list, and we have figured out a way to take about three quarters of the people off the waiting list. And then we've got a couple of people a week that are just having to, they're not able to come. And so they're canceling and we're replacing them off the waiting list. So there's still a possibility you could come. If we go through enough of that waiting list, the registration page is found at whitecoatinvestor.com. So feel free to get on the waiting list if you'd still like to come to it. It's March 12th through 14th in Las Vegas at the Paris Las Vegas Hotel. But we've got a lot of great people like Phil DeMuth speaking there. It's going to be great. Now, Phil, when you sent me your W-9 for your conference speaking fee, you employed a rather interesting tax reduction tactic. You didn't include your social security number on the form. (laughs) And uh, I'm going to get as much mileage out of this incident as I can. Now, obviously, that was accidental. But do you have any advice to my listeners about how to make sure that the tax reduction tactics they are employing are tax avoidance and not tax evasion? Yeah, well, and again, for some reason... This seems to be an especial weakness of the physician class because doctors seem always to be interested in the tax angle, probably because they're so incredibly taxed to begin with. It's a, it's a sensitive uh, subject. And it, again, if it sounds too good to be true, it almost certainly is too good to be true. And if it sounds, if the tax picture sounds bad, if your accountant says, gosh, you pay a lot of taxes this year. He's probably right. If you're going to be suffering, that's, that's the correct perception of, uh, of reality. On the other hand, the, the good news is, is uh, an account told one of my clients, you're never going to be audited because they're going to look at how much you make, but then they're going to look at how much taxes you pay and think, this guy is fine. He's, uh, he's suffered enough. Anything that promises to be a tax haven, anything that takes your money offshore, anything that's, you know, if you're going to be trading Bitcoin in a foreign account and not telling the IRS, these are going to get you into a lot of trouble because the IRS, they don't care about any of this stuff. They look at facts and circumstances. They are willing to undo any series of step transactions you've done to try to hide money from them. So don't mess around. If you're ultra high net worth, you can fight the IRS. You can say, oh, oh yeah, I got your letter. Deal with my tax attorney. See ya. But if, if you don't have $100 million, you're not in that position. If you have $5 million and you say to the IRS, oh, yeah, deal with my tax attorney, well, pretty soon you're not going to have $5 billion. It's gonna, that money's going to all go to your attorney and paying fees. So you want to color within the lines. You want to give the IRS a wide berth because you can't afford to fight them. They're, they've got more power than you do. Now, let's talk about your newest book, which I love, The Overtaxed Investor. As I was thumbing through it again in preparation for this, I stopped at the opening anecdote, which has you talking to a client which, with $100,000 in capital gains who paid $0 on those gains in tax. I found that intriguing as that was not really my understanding of how the capital gains tax brackets worked. 
So I, I actually was worried. I was confused about it. I went through the instructions by hand and it seemed there was no way to get out of paying taxes on $100,000 in capital gains. There's no way to get them completely tax free unless you had some other taxable loss out there to offset it. So in 2019, if you were married filing jointly, and you had $78,700 in taxable ordinary income and $100,000 in capital gains that you pay 15% on essentially all of those capital gains despite being in the 12% ordinary income tax bracket. The anecdote seems to suggest that you pay 0% on those capital gains. Am I missing something there? Or was that uh, suggesting something that maybe isn't sh- shouldn't be there? Well, it's a good question. The uh, This uh, emerged out of a conversation I had with the client. As far as I know, he's not in jail at the present time for tax avoidance. And it's the one that conversation that got me intrigued in the whole area of, oh my gosh, what don't I know here that I ought to know? But in theory, as I think about it, if if he's got a $78,000 of overhead before he gets into a bracket where he has to start paying taxes, but he also has, you know, he's married, he's got a $24,000 standard deduction, and then another $2,600 because he and his wife are over 65, then that puts you over the $100,000 mark. TurboTax, and in the tax caster, it doesn't show that there's any tax liability. But I, you know, it was not my tax return, so I haven't analyzed it beyond that. Okay. So uh, basically, this person had other deductions that lowered their ordinary income tax. The standard deduction that every couple would have would have been enough to do it, as far as I can see. Now, in the first chapter of the book, you list all the taxes we pay, which is, it's overwhelming to read through them all. There's income taxes and sales taxes and gas tax and hotel tax and excise tax and property tax. What percentage of the income of a typical doctor do you think is going to taxes of some kind? Well, this is a terrifying question. What I have done is I I just uh, noticed that Greg Mankiw, he's the uh, Harvard economist. And he used to be head of the President's Council of Economic Advisors, and he's written the standard Economics 101 textbook that uh, everybody uses in college. He estimates, he's a college professor, that his all-in tax rate is 90%. Wow. And this is just what he pays on his salary, dividends, interest, estate taxes, money going to his kids. And then I thought, well, God, that sounds high. And then I was reading John Cochran, an economist at Stanford. I think he's at the Hoover Institute there. And he says, well, he pays uh, 42% federal, 13% state, 10% sales tax, 6% property tax. It goes on and on. And he argued that if, as some presidential candidates have argued, we should have a 70% marginal tax rate, he said if that was the all-in inclusive tax rate for everything, that would be a tax cut for many high-income Americans. Wow. So it's just, it's a horrifying figure. And of course, a lot of it's disguised, especially now, you know, Congress delegates its authority different, to different agencies, and then aid the agencies set up their own tax rates and bed them into what they're doing. So it's a big mess. Now, in the book, you also argue that the story of Star Wars is all about taxes. You know, you you quote the beginning uh, uh, scroll there in the first movie where it talks about the the taxation of trade routes is in dispute. Do you think this country can actually implement a fair tax solution without six movies of intergalactic uh, dispute? It's very important to look at Star Wars from the accounting point of view. This is often overlooked. People, you know, focus focus on the force and lightsabers. But actually, the tax angle is a very fruitful one to follow as you watch the films. But anyway... It's very, very problematic. It looks like what's happened is we've moved into a situation where every eight years or four years even, the the tax code can change when a new administration comes into town. So the Democrats come in, they sweep, they get Congress, and they suddenly raise taxes to where they should be, so to speak. And the Republicans, you know, get in four, eight years later, they lower taxes. And This is a planning catastrophe. If you don't have a stable set of rules that you're playing under, it makes planning, you kind of just throw your number two pencil up in the air because it it might be this way or it might be that way. If we could have a steady state tax code, even if a lot of people thought it was bad, a lot of people thought it was unfair and complained about it, if it was just the same, if it just stayed the same for three decades at a time, 
it would make everybody's life a lot easier. And we just lose a lot of economic value to this needless jostling back and forth, having to do our wills over our financial plans over. It just creates a lot of chaos that's completely unnecessary. You know, economists, you know, feel that taxes should really be just based on consumption. You know, a value-added tax would do the least overall damage to the economy, and uh, we could scrap everything else we've got going on. And then if you want to help people, at the end of the day, you take you – know, the Congress simply says, okay, well, we're going to give poor people money to make them less poor. And it's a sort of a social policy instead of trying to use the tax code to solve 500 different problems. So I don't like it. And, of course, none of this will ever happen. We're, we're con- going to continue to have this kind of a mess because it's very useful in terms of funding re-election campaign for our representatives. That's my cynical opinion, but I'm, I don't think I'm wrong. <laughs> <laughs> As we go into some of these other topics we're going to cover today, I think I, it's important to put this disclaimer on the beginning of it and point out that you and I agree about 98, maybe 99 percent of the financial world. But in the effort to produce a more interesting and entertaining podcast, we're going to focus a little bit more on some of the controversial topics, some of the controversial things you've said and written in the past. Sure, sure. And kind of get into some of these, you know, a little bit more gray topics where we don't necessarily always agree, but I think it makes for an interesting conversation. So I occasionally hear you argue for zero dividend individual stocks held in a taxable account. Isn't that letting the tax tail wag the investment dog? In fact, in your book, you say your asset allocation is an illusion because most people don't tax adjust their asset allocation. So first, you should make sure you are not needlessly overpaying the taxes on your portfolio and then worry about your asset allocation after that. Taxes come first. Does tax reduction really matter more than asset allocation? Uh, For some people, I think it does. It's, It's not only the problem... Uh, the fact that your uh, asset allocation is not really right because you haven't figured out what everything is worth after tax and made that adjustment. But it, it, here's another big problem. And another illusion that we have is that, you know, I think I own the S&P 500 index fund. So I'm great. But the problem is that in itself could be chimerical because then you hit, you know, a downturn. It's down 50 percent. And uh, you think, oh, gosh, I made a terrible mistake here. I sell it. So even though a Boglehead efficient portfolio seems like the answer for 99% of the population, if not 100% of the population, in practice, many people can't stick to it because they are closet market timers and they also way overestimate their risk tolerance. And so they panic at the worst possible time. Now, the part about not owning inefficient tax assets. One of the people I was thinking about there is the a, a group that I have a very soft spot for in my heart, the ultra high net worth, people with 50, 100 million dollars. Because what happens when you get into that group, I'm told, I'm certainly not in that group myself. I know I know that you are Dr. Jim, but for, for the, the <laughs> others of us who are not yet there, what happens is that it, once like the first generation of the family who actually earned all the money in the, in the first place dies off, then the rest of the family is relatively clueless about money. And so the investment banks prey upon these people and they say, well, we'll take care of you. We're going to educate you. So they, they pack them off to these various seminars for ultra rich people. And at the seminars, you'll, you'll spend Monday morning learning about stocks. But then Tuesday through Friday is spent learning about hedge funds, private equity, venture capital, esoteric assets, collectibles, all this stuff that is extremely tax inefficient to get involved with for the most part. And yet they give people a a kind of pseudo sense that, oh, yeah, I I know about how to invest in hedge funds because I spent uh, a couple of hours yesterday morning learning about them. Uh, where basically they have no clue what they're doing. They're going to be completely reliant on multiple layers of advisors to help them. And it's just going to be a way of milking the family fortune. And they're going to be steered into these snobby and inscrutable assets. So I remember one of these conferences that I went to, and I saw that Jack Bogle was speaking at, at the next version of this conference. So I immediately sent him an email and told him, 
to give all these rich people hell about what they're doing and to just stick with a very simple portfolio. So I'm just concerned that a lot of people get funneled into this stuff they don't really understand. They're scripted for dependence, and the taxes and the fees just go through the roof. So even, so even very rich people, I think they'd be far better off if they invested in, in a Boglehead portfolio and not get sidetracked into the, all this other nonsense. That's probably a minority view, but that's what I think. Now, I mean, there's obviously a lot of money that can be saved in keeping expenses down and keeping taxes down. But I think the traditional approach has always been asset allocation first, and then you pick your investments, and then you try to you know reduce your taxes as best you can with tax loss harvesting and using retirement accounts, et cetera. But you seem to have uh, you know that the taxes are really where it's at. That's really where the bang for your buck is at, and your asset allocation is almost superfluous. That's a pretty unusual viewpoint out there. Well, it's basically what it means is you get rid of holding very tax inefficient assets. So, you know, all, alternative investments can be very tax inefficient. You could probably live without them. REITs can be very tax inefficient if you don't have a good place to hold them. Gold. Uh, it, otherwise, if you're just investing in a global stock fund, you know, Vanguard's global, you know, VT, global stock exchange traded fund, I think that's just dandy. I'm, I'm happy to have, uh, People invest in that, including rich people who would pay high taxes, invest in a fund like that all day long. So I'm not quite as controversial. The one thing that I do that is more controversial is that I've taken a, an especial interest in zero dividend stocks and very low dividend stocks. And I've been punished for doing this because it's worked extremely well for the last decade. It, it, because Why? Well, because what are some of these low dividend stocks? Google, Netflix, they've just taken off like a rocket. And so, and meanwhile, my small value funds are suffering. They're lagging the market. So clients like, oh my gosh, this guy's a genius. Look, look at how well he's done. But in fact, it's just, it could easily, it just as easily have gone the other way. So I'm simply banking that in many cases, once you have a, a good basic asset, asset allocation in place, you have the right kind of exposures. For the marginal dollar, instead of buying more mutual funds that are going to have a lot of tax consequences, you might be better off buying stock like Berkshire Hathaway. It's almost like a mutual fund in its own right, but doesn't pay dividend. And by the way, I've started to get some traction with, with this idea. Jalilo has written an article that's gotten some attention in financial planning. It's extremely critical of dividends. Now, I, I love dividend stocks. I wrote a book about dividend stocks. I think they're great to the extent to which you need to spend the money or you can house them in an IRA. But if you get a dividend that you don't need, that's like a realized capital gain. It's, it's an accounting identity with a realized capital gain with zero cost basis, which is the worst kind you can have. So the expense of accruing dividends in taxable accounts year after year for high income people can subtract a lot of value. So I'm, I'm very sensitive. I'm, my heart goes out to these people. So I'm, I'm trying to do everything I can to make that tax bill as low as possible, especially because as I've seen, I cannot control investment returns. You know, I can try to have a global asset allocation and I can, you know, hope, hope to get the rewards from that, but it's out of my hands. I thought small value stocks were to do great for the last 10 years, and they haven't done that great. They've, they've lagged it's just a simple index fund. So to the extent to which I can, I really try to control the taxes where I sort of, I know what I'm doing, and I know that if I do this, I'm going to cut people's taxes by this amount. Whereas if I invest their account differently, different kinds of asset classes, maybe it'll turn out great. Maybe it won't turn out great. So the, the tax focus gives me an, an illusion of more and better control and something that really pays off, especially for people who are tax sensitive. Now, admittedly, a portfolio of individual zero dividend stocks is going to be slightly more tax efficient than buying the Vanguard Total Stock Market Index Fund, which does pay out about a 2% yield each year. Right. So how many of these stocks do you have to buy? before that uncompensated risk you're taking on buying individual stocks can be lowered enough that it is lower than the cost of paying that additional tax on that 2% yield. Fascinating. Well, it, it, let's just take the S&P 500. 
five, let's say there are 500 stocks in that group. Of those, you'll probably find that, I don't know, 300, 325 of them pay a dividend. So those are out. So then you're left with this other portfolio of maybe 150, 175 stocks. And that portfolio historically has done better after tax than if you owned the whole, if you owned all of them and paid taxes at 15% on your dividends and capital gains. So that's, that's the good news. In practice, I don't own all those stocks. I probably own, you know, 50 of them that are a sort of a sampling that I think are good ones to focus on. That's the goal. It, but historically, you've been better off right from the gate doing it. And then there are other things that people can do with these zero tax or super low tax portfolios. The most obvious one of which, or not necessarily obvious, but the most conspicuous is you can uh, take a portfolio loan against it. So if, you, if you're a rich person, you've got a $50 million portfolio, and you own a bunch of zero dividend stocks. You own Berkshire Hathaway. You own Google. You own Amazon. And you want spending money. Well, instead of selling those and paying capital gains, and those capital gains could be pretty significant if you've owned them for a while, what you do is you just borrow against it. You take a portfolio loan. And the portfolio loan, which comes to you at a very low rate because it's totally secured by the uh, liquid assets underlying it, that's not a taxable event. So you just you have to pay a little interest on the loan, but there are no taxes because the uh, asset is offset by a liability on the other side. There's no net income. It's not an income-producing event. So you live off the income for 20 years, and then you die, and, and your heirs get a step up in basis, and then the next generation does the same thing. That's one way that ultra-high-net-worth people live and pay up as taxes than doctors do. Yeah, you just have to weigh the interest costs against the tax costs, take whichever one's lower. Exactly, exactly. So while we're on the subject of asset allocation, one of my favorite quotes of yours is, even if risk tolerance existed and could be measured accurately, why would it be an important factor to consult when considering how to invest? You should invest in the way that has the greatest prospect to fulfill your investment goals. That might mean taking more or less risk than you would prefer. If you are a sensitive soul who can brook no paper losses, the solution is to get a grip, not to invest safely if that locks in running out of money when you are old. What do you mean by that quote? And can people really buck up and tolerate a, a really volatile portfolio just like that? Uh, probably not. It's probably just uh, correct, technically correct, but completely useless advice. Uh, on the other hand, uh, when I was in high school, I broke my ankle playing when I was playing football. And when I went to the emergency room, the doctor did not ask me about what is my cast wearing tolerance. He didn't say, well, Phil, how would you feel about wearing a cast for the next month? Would, you, would that be bad? Would that be make you uncomfortable, make you feel bad? He, he didn't even ask that question. He just put a cast on my leg and basically said, deal with it, kid. You know, So I think that in a way, that's the correct approach. If, if there's something that's this important, it would be better if we could learn to deal with it. Now, and part of the problem here, the SEC says that uh, advisors need to analyze their clients' risk tolerance before putting them into a portfolio. And uh, this makes sense to some extent because you don't want people to just sell everything the first time the market drops 3% in one day. It's still a problem because there's no way to actually judge a person's risk tolerance in advance. The industry is littered with these risk tolerance questionnaires. But these are questionnaires that have no predictive validity whatsoever. They have a kind of face validity that asks you, do you like kilo skiing and mountain climbing, or do you prefer spending your afternoon in the library? Questions like this, is this that has some relevance to your investing style? But the whole thing, the whole industry seems to be completely on the wrong foot here. And yet, it would be easily possible to come up with a questionnaire that has some predictive validity because Schwab and Fidelity know all the people that capitulated during the last big market meltdown. It would be easily possible for some enterprising PhD student to get a hold of some of this data, see what questionnaires these clients might have taken in the past, and see what, if anything, did predict. But the whole risk tolerance game is a, uh, it doesn't really work as far as I can tell. 
Now, you say in the book that everything you've heard about how passive investing beats active management goes double after tax. Can you explain what you mean by that? It's almost a miracle, it seems to me, because the best portfolio is what might be called the global market portfolio, the portfolio that owns everything. It owns every stock in the world, every bond in the world, every publicly traded asset class you can invest in at a market cap weighting. This is like the ideal portfolio. And uh, it turns out you can buy that much more cheaply than you can by hiring active managers to try their wizardry to, to do better. This is the sort of the, what you might call the ideal boglehead approach. Well, it turns out, almost by coincidence, that that exact portfolio is also comparatively cheap to hold, at least on the stock side, because it has very low turnover. You know, whoever it's Standard & Poor's, when they get together every year to decide on which stocks they ought to be in the index, it doesn't change the index very much. They, you know, get rid of a couple of dogs. They hire on a couple of new stocks. Uh, so it's very low turnover, very low cheap. So it's a cheap portfolio to buy. It's cheap to hold in terms of your expense ratio. And it also turns out to be very cheap in terms of your tax cost ratio. So this is just a win-win-win as far as I'm concerned. Let's talk a little bit about mutual funds. I love mutual funds. They're great. They provide liquidity. They provide professional management. They provide ready diversification. But they've got one kind of nasty quirk. They, you know, like to pass along any capital gains that they generate buying and selling securities in the fund to their investors. Yet by law, they're not allowed to pass along their internal losses to the shareholders. You never get a deductible loss you can use on your taxes from your mutual fund. Do you think that's fair? And do you think it's ever likely to change? Uh, no, it's certainly not fair. And it's also very unlikely to change. I remember uh, when uh, Gene Fama, the Nobel Prize winner, wrote an uh, editorial in the Wall Street Journal along with Ken French complaining about this 20 years ago. And, and nothing ever happened. I think the people that would benefit just fund shareholders are too dispersed and they don't have any political clout. There, there's no constituent that's saying, yes, we must do it. And then now the problem is that this issue with the traditional open ended mutual funds has been sort of bypassed by the exchange traded funds, which don't have the same capital gains pass through problem. They're able to diffuse their capital gains in the markets the way they trade. So I was talking to an investor the other day. He says, Phil, what do we do? We've all got these huge holdings in mutual funds that we've built up over the last 20 years. We have enormous embedded gains and we can't get rid of them. They're a monkey strapped to our back. Every year they, they get all these dividends. We get all these capital gains we don't want help what could we do so we're all in this in this boat we all wish we had exchange traded funds where we weren't a victim to this same process and now what's what's going to happen is that even these exchange traded funds are going to be bypassed by something that's now called it's just coming along they they call it direct indexing but i think the better way of thinking about it is what I wrote about in that Affluent Investor book, which is that given computerization, it's now comparatively easy to just take a look at a uh, client, take a look at you know what's their tax situation, what's their personal human capital like, what, what industry do they work in, how secure is their career, and then to basically custom tailor a portfolio of individual stocks and bonds and whatever around that person, giving them, in effect, the holdings of the global market portfolio, but correcting for the tilts and the biases that their own happenstance circumstances, you know, I'm a doctor and I live in Houston and I own a million dollar house there. I mean, they can correct for all of this stuff by counterweighting the rest of the portfolio so it's not distorted in the same way. So all this can be done. Computers can easily uh, handle the task, and I've been waiting for a decade or so for this to happen, and it's only now just beginning to come on the horizon. But when this hits and it'll hit in a big way, 
suddenly we're going to be saying, wait a minute, we still got these mutual funds. I want, also want out of these exchange traded funds to help get me out of here, get me into this new, better system. You know, it's, it's like the Apple CarPlay and not like the old eight track that I've got in my old car, you know. So I think that's what that's what's coming. Now, we're talking about reducing investment taxes with Phil DeMuth here, if you're just tuning in. Let's talk about some of the biggest investment related tax mistakes that you see investors making. Well, they make uh, they make all of them. Probably the worst one is that investors have somehow got the idea that it's important to realize their gains. You know, so if the stock is up, okay, I'm up, I made 10% on Amazon, so it's time for me to sell it and buy something else. And then at the same time, they say, oh, you know, I guess I, I bought that, uh, that marijuana stock. I thought it was going to do well. I, I was certain it was, but now it's down 20%. I know it's going to, at legalization, it's going to all come back. So I'm just gonna I'm just gonna wait. I'm gonna hold that. And uh, of course, this is just psychological manipulation. Basically, people should be doing the exact opposite. They should be holding on to anything they've got with the game, not realizing it, just letting it run. But they're losers. They should be selling almost immediately and banking the, the tax loss from it and using it against ordinary income or to offset other gains they're getting. It's a, uh, th- that's just sort of an obvious thing that people invariably get it wrong. So keep your winners and sell your losers, not the other way around. Any other mistakes you see people making frequently? Well, all kinds. They uh, don't fund their retirement plans to the f- fullest extent. They uh, don't tax loss harvest their accounts. You know, just sort of the, the vanilla stuff that we go, we run through in the book is all it's it's very commonsensical. They all should be doing all of these things, and they don't either out of ignorance or laziness or something. Do you think tax loss harvesting is oversold? It's oversold, but it's underpracticed, and that's because tax loss harvesting, if you're going to really do it well, it requires searching through all of the individual tax lots of all of your holdings. You just look, if you just look at the mutual fund, you know, I own the Fidelity Magellan fund and I'm up, I'm up 10% of that. So that's great. But in fact, if you've been reinvesting dividends and capital gains in that fund for 20 years, and you actually sort through all of the underlying lots that you own, some of those lots are going to have done great. And some of the lots you you know bought at the wrong time, and uh, they're, they're going to have done badly. So you should always comb through, sell whatever is down, and keep whatever is uh, going if it otherwise fits within your investment strategy. And you know it's nice the three thousand dollar a year deduction from ordinary income is pleasant. It's not exactly going to make you rich. The, the real benefit is if you can use tax loss harvesting to be able to draw down from a taxable account, say, during retirement for a number of years without realizing capital gains, and eventually shove all of your capital gains into an account that is left in your estate where it gets a reset to fair market value. And that's, that's of course, a great thing. Now, you've discussed family loans before as an advanced tax trick. Can you explain how that works to reduce your taxes? Right. Family loans are basically about wealth transfer. So if I'm from a wealthy family and I have uh, some kids and I, let's say I've got an extra, you know, a couple of million dollars just sitting in the bank, what, you know, what might I do with it? Well, if I invest that money myself, that the money's going to grow, but then all that growth is going to be part of my estate. So it's ultimately going to be taxed at some point, assuming I have an estate that's big enough to be taxed. It's going to be a problem in some way. So a better way of doing that would be to loan the kids a couple billion dollars and let the kids invest it in some way. You know, let them use it to buy a house, use it to buy an investment portfolio, use it to start a business of their own. And then have them pay me back just a rate of interest on the loan. Now, the the other good thing about this is that when you do this, you can use what's called the applicable federal rate, which is a actually a sub market rate of interest. 
So today, I, th- I don't know what it is, probably, you know, two, a little over 2%, which means that the kids could pay you back. If your kids pay you back $15,000 a year on the loan, that would cover a pretty good amount. And plus, while you can't forgive that amount, you could separately, completely unrelated to anything else. This is a totally different conversation now. You could give your kids and their spouses, you and your bride, give the kids and their spouses $15,000 a year just as a gift. And if they happen to give you, pay you back a check that maybe something that's about that amount in relation to servicing the loan that you've given them, then that's all to the good. The main thing, though, if you try this, is that it has to be formally set up. It's got to be for real. The IRS, when they look at family loans, they say, oh, Dr. Jim, very nice of you to do this. I see you made a $2.5 million gift to your son. It's very nice. And you say, well, wait, wait, excuse me. That wasn't a gift. I'm loaning him. And they say, prove it. So at that point, you want to be able to say, well, here's the documents. Here, here's the loan document. Here is the collateral. Here is this check. So he's been paying me every month on this. This is a legit transaction. This is not a gift. This is a loan. So you have to be able, be able to document that it's really there. But if so, it's a uh, it's a nice technique. It's a, a nice way to uh, help your kids if you have the money to do it. Cool. That is a pretty slick trick, and you can see that uh, you know you can basically. Forgive an amount of interest up to the amount of, of gift tax each year, uh, the gift tax exemption. Well, I, I, I wouldn't put it that way. I would just say you're being, you happen to be a generous individual, you generous with your gifting, uh, the fifteen thousand dollar tax exempt gift every year, and you're also generous in making a nice loan to the kids. Yeah. I, they don't really have anything to do with each other. It's just, <laughs> just it works out that way. Yeah, and, it, and it's far more than fifteen thousand too. If there's two spouses, you know, your kid and your kid's spouse, and you and your spouse. I mean, we're now talking about sixty thousand dollars a year in gifts that wouldn't be included in the gift tax. So that's that's right. That covers that's an right. awful lot of interest on, on a pretty large loan at two percent. Yeah, you can you could do two and a half million dollars uh, of a, of a loan roughly with that. I wouldn't have them line up exactly, but I, if, if they lined up approximately, that that's probably fine. Yeah. Now you uh, have some rather controversial ideas about charities. You <laughs> have argued that supporting charities is often a bad idea, and your argument is basically that the most efficient system is when people spend their own money on their own behalf, and the least efficient system is when people spend other people's money on behalf of a third group of people. And you argue that in that respect, charities are inefficient, like government is. In fact, you say it's safe to assume that any charity is a well-meaning scam until your own research proves otherwise. (laughs) Yes. So how can a charity that is not a scam be identified a priori? Right. Well, I realize this is sort of a minority view. Unfortunately, uh, it it happens to be correct. The state of philanthropy in our country is just a national scandal. And I think it will receive increasing attention in the future, certainly from me, if nobody else. When you look around, charities basically operate in a pre-scientific world where they're trading in, you know, anecdotes and photographs of them doing good and pictures of animals. And basically what they're selling is a feel-good moment for the donor. So the donor can relieve themselves of their guilt and they can feel like, oh yeah, I'm an, I'm an important difference maker in the world. So this is the state of things. The outfit that I actually do recommend in this regard, is called GiveWell. And they are a charity evaluator group. And their story is interesting. I'm sure I've got it mostly wrong. But it basically began in San Francisco, I don't know, 10, 15 years ago, by a series of hedge fund kids. And they realized they were all making too much money and they wanted to do something constructive with it. So they would meet at lunchtime and they would each talk about, you know, they'd each research a charity because they spent their whole day researching businesses. And they'd research some charities to try to find some good charities to give money to. And what they quickly found is there weren't any. They'd go to the charity websites and there was nothing but pictures and cute stories. But they'd say, okay, but what's the research that shows that you guys are actually accomplishing something? And there isn't any. Or if there is some, it's incredibly biased, flawed, and absurd. So they've been doing this. They started their own. They broke off from the hedge fund world, started their own evaluation service. They've been doing it for years. And they've now, I think they've got a list of about 
eight charities that they think are worthwhile. Which is amazing considering there's 8,000 or 80,000 in, in the world. Oh, yeah. There's a lot, a lot of charities and private foundations and, and all this stuff. So it's horrible. Now, they're focused, you know, they don't focus on, you know, should I give money to the opera? They don't focus on, should I give money to the uh, University, University of Alabama football team? Which, you know, which a lot of people do. They focus on, if I want to give away a dollar, where is my dollar most likely to do the most good in terms of humanitarian work? And so, for example, one of their charities is called Give Directly. And what Give Directly does is it takes your dollar and it gives it to poor people in Kenya and Uganda. Because uh, the idea is you give poor people money and they're less poor. And they don't. it's, it's not like some patronizing event where you're saying, you know, take this particular approach that we think is going to help you. They figure You can figure out best how to use this dollar if you're poor. So they don't tie, have any strings to it. And they're also researching how they do, how it's working, to try to be as transparent as possible. So that's uh, one of them. The other thing uh, I should just point out, I think that many physicians are not aware that the entire existence of modern medicine is due to the philanthropy of J.D. Rockefeller. Because Rockefeller was a golfing buddy of a homeopathic physician. And this homeopathic physician was hitting him up to build him a uh, medical school. And Rockefeller turned to his advisor, Frederick Taylor Gates, and said, what, does that guy ought to give this guy some money or not? Gates went to the library. He took out all of the medical textbooks that he could find, and he read them. And he came back to Rockefeller and said, that guy you're playing golf with is a complete quack. And not only that, these other doctors you know that also want you to build them hospitals, medical schools, they're also quacks. They just don't know it. Because the field of medicine knows practically nothing. They've got descriptions of thousands of diseases. They have treatments of some kind for some of them. And they have cures for a few. We don't need more doctors, hospitals, medical schools. What we need is bench research. We need medical science about the causes and treatments of disease. You ought to put all your money into that. Forget about this other stuff. And Rockefeller took his advice and he did it. And that changed, that basically changed the world. So that, and that's why we're all, we're all here today because of, of the great things that came out of that fundamental change in direction of, of medicine that uh, philanthropy caused. All right. Let's talk a little bit about these tax tricks, these tax tactics. We've talked about them a lot on my blog. On this podcast, we talked about them. What I've never really done, though, is tried to rank them. So if you looked at all of these tactics, you know, maximizing the use of retirement accounts, using tax-efficient investments in your taxable accounts, getting your asset location right, making sure your dividends are qualified and that your uh, capital gains are long-term, depreciating real estate, tax loss harvesting, donating appreciated shares to charity to flush those capital gains out of your portfolio, getting the step up in basis at death. If you had to rank those, which two or three would you put at the top of the list that give you the biggest bang for your buck? If you're one of these 80-20 kind of people, which of those do you need to get right in order to, to get most of the bang for your buck out of investing tax efficiently? Well, unfortunately, each of them make a small positive contribution. So they're all, all worth doing, especially keeping your, the turnover of your accounts low is extremely important and getting rid of these gratuitous capital gains. If you can minimize dividends where possible, that's a great thing to do. They're all good. I think that there are a couple of things that are even not beyond that list that are worth paying close attention to. And that has to do with the fact that there are a couple of periods in your life where you can make a big difference to the overall curve, your overall financial curve, if you take advantage of them when you're there. And they're both periods when you're relatively, you're likely to be relatively low income. And so you're going to have more options. One of them would be when you're starting out in your career, very early stages, you would have opportunities to 
donate a lot to the extent to which you can save any money that's just incredibly valuable because it gives you the gift of long-term compounding you might have a chance to open Roth IRAs and be able to do long-term compounding tax-free so that's extremely important in fact I've come up with a phrase it's called live like a resident <laughs> if you can just if you, I'm gonna I'm gonna trademark this because I think I think it's so cool if, if you wait, actually I got that from you <laughs> but if you can do that for just a little bit and get your financial ducks in a row early and put more money away in savings and have that grow over your lifetime, that's going to make a difference between night and day for you. The other interesting time is after you retire, but before you have to start taking required minimum distributions in Social Security. This is a time when you can perhaps do Roth conversions of your IRA and really try to optimize your whole tax picture in retirement, which again could be tremendously beneficial, especially if you also look through to the next generation and figure out, well, who am I going to ultimately leave these assets to? What's their tax bracket? And try to arrange the whole thing so you're paying as much of the money as possible, paying as much of the taxes as possible in as low a rate as possible. I think that that's very important to take advantage of if you can do it. And it's worth getting some, it's worth getting some help. If you've never used financial planners at any other time in your life, it's worth talking to them when you're starting out. And I think it's worth talking to them when you're, you know, on the cusp of retirement to figure out a game plan. Maybe you don't, you don't have to stick with them forever, but at least try to get everything set up correctly then because it could really pay off. Now let's talk a little bit about a current event in Congress right now is the SECURE Act. And I'm hearing a lot of politicians saying they think it's going to pass, at least in some form. You recently wrote a very widely read article about that. Can you talk briefly about the basic changes that will occur if it passes and how much they really matter? Sure. Uh, happy to, because I'm really riled up about this. The SECURE Act is a bunch of different uh, provisions that affect our retirement plans. And it passed the House 417 to 3, was slated to pass the Senate, and I looked at the provisions and I sort of analyzed them. I said, this is, this is horrible. This is a nightmare. So I wrote about it for the Wall Street Journal, and then the Wall Street Journal blessed their souls on their editorial page the following week. They basically just said, yeah, we, we think this is a bad idea, too. It, it, simultaneously, I emailed all of my clients, everybody I knew said, please contact your senators immediately. I sent their senators email contacts. I said, let them tell Congress to keep their hands off of your IRA. What this bill does is it pays for itself by taxing our retirement plans when we leave them to our kids. So inherited IRAs, as it stands now, your kids can stretch out the payments over their actuarial lifetimes. And this is great. But the the new plan is going to be, oh, no, the kids have to take the money out in 10 years. And, well, if your kid inherits a substantial IRA, that's going to be a lot of money they're pulling out over those 10 years, which means about an extra third of it is going to be taxed. If your kid happens to have kids that are going to college of his own and needs to apply for some kind of financial aid, it's going to completely screw up the financial aid package. So they're going to the expected family contributions is going to be much higher. It's not going to. To go, it's going to either go to the government or to some college administrators. It's not going to go to your kids' retirement. So the fact that this bill could have gotten so far it was just sailing through, no discussion, no debate. I was just completely, and I am I'm still baffled. I understand that the bill is being promoted by the insurance industry because one of the provisions is that all these uh, retirement plans, your 401k, your IRAs, they're going to have to have an annuity as a uh, potential offering. So the insurance companies love this. But the financial press is pretty much asleep at the switch. I'm just astonished that nobody has picked up on, on this and what a terrible consequence it is. And of course, the people that hits the worst are not it's not doesn't hurt the people that are the 44 percent of people that don't pay any federal income tax they're not bothered really rich people aren't bothered by this either interestingly because they don't have very much of their wealth in retirement plans they're all in these huge taxable accounts but who is hurt by it are the upper income people that have big salaries and have big iras 
there's another word for those people. Those are physicians and professionals, lawyers, doctors, CPAs. These people are all going to just be hosed by this. And everybody thinks it's great. Yeah, let's have them pay for it. But, but there's no constituency that's representing these people and saying, uh, no, let's, let's not do this. I was thinking AARP. Well, they get half their funding from the insurance industry. So they, they don't think it's a problem. So my suggestion for the listeners is that they're, they're going to try again this fall. We got it derailed for the summer. They're going to try it again to get it passed. It's going to probably be attached to a spending bill. And if they can succeed in doing that, those bills always pass. This is going to be the new order. If you want to have a third of your money going for your IRAs, going to the government, that's fine. Do nothing. It'll probably happen. If you'd like to have that money go to your families instead, I would encourage you to just Google, you know, contact my senators, send them an email saying them, please do not vote for the SECURE Act in any form. Have the government take, keep their hands off my uh, IRA and because I've been planning on this for the last 20 years and now you want to change the goalposts in the last minutes of the game. It's not fair. Now, a, a lot of people would criticize that argument and say, hardly anybody's stretching their IRAs longer than 10 years anyway, and most people don't have much of an IRA to start with. If you look at the average IRA or 401k balance in this country, it, it's pitifully low, and most of it is spent in the first half of retirement by the typical middle class folks. And you know, so that's kind of the criticism is that this is a way to tax the rich if you're taxing anybody, but that really... Nobody's stretching these things out anyway because the heirs can't seem to keep their paws off the money longer than 10 years. They all pull it out in the first 10 years anyway. Do you think it's really going to affect all that many people? Well, according to the, the Wall Street Journal's editorial on this, it, it, you know, first of all, you're completely correct. If you have a small IRA, you're going to spend it all yourself. And if you have even, even if you have a you know, $500,000 IRA, you'll spend that yourself in retirement pretty much. And any thing the kids get, you know, they'll buy a new car immediately with the, the day the check clears. So that, mo that money is gone. But if you have a million dollar IRA or a multi-million dollar IRA, that's going to be a problem. Your million dollar IRA when you're 65 could still be a million dollar IRA after withdrawals at age, you know, 85. And so that's going to your kids and where it's going to be, uh, you know, quickly dispersed and uh, taxed heavily. I think the, the Wall Street Journal's editorial suggested that maybe one in every four dollars in retirement plans would be affected by this. And in fact, I, I downloaded the, the government's own paperwork, uh, own uh, financial analysis. And what I realized is the way they sold it was that the bill would pay for itself over the course of 10 years. But if you extrapolate the costs versus the income, the new revenues they're going to be bringing in, every year after those 10 years, the gap widens hugely. So by 2050, the uh, government is going to be taking in an extra $4 billion a year in tax revenue from our IRAs uh, and using it for its own particular projects. And this is completely screwed up again, our ability to make any kind of uh, financial plans. This is not the deal that we were promised when we were told we can contribute to these tax deferred accounts. Now, you're obviously clearly against the limitation on the stretch IRA provision. It doesn't sound like you're very happy about the provision that uh, requires an annuity option to be in the retirement accounts, as, as it sounds like a big boon <laughs> to the insurance industry. There's one other uh, provision that's pretty widespread and well known about it, and that's increasing the RMD age to 72, maybe 72 and a half. I don't recall. Uh, you see that as good, bad, indifferent, doesn't matter. What do you think? Uh, I'm, I'm all in favor of it. I think that's, a, I would be happy to uh, extend the RMD age any chance I can get. What, what I found so bitterly humorous about it is that, that it, it, there's no, possible way that extending the IRA RMD age from 70 to 72, which by the way, that's for some people, that's one year. For other people, that's two years. It depends on which, which month of the year you were born in, whether or not you get to collect a one year or two year benefit. But that somehow, you know, compensates for spending, getting the entire IRA, IRA ultimately taxed 
over a 10 year period when it's inherited. It's just a, a complete joke. But, but to get back to the insurance companies for a minute, my favorite provision of the bill is there's a safe harbor given to the plan administrators. They don't need to worry about making sure that it's the lowest cost annuity that they offer. They can offer the highest price annuity if they think that's what's going to be in the best interest of their plan holders. So I can just imagine the lavish seminars that are going to be held in Hawaii where the insurance industry invites the plan sponsors to come and spend a week. And we'll spend a couple of hours a day talking about uh, investing. And then we'll play golf and go to the beach. It's going to be a great time. It's a great time to be in a 401k plan sponsor. You're going to have some real bennies here. <laughs> now, we, we're starting to get a little bit long on the podcast now. But I wanted uh, listeners to get a chance to hear about what you're working on now, your next project. What's going on in your life now? I'm revising the tax book like a madman, trying to figure out you know, how to put the SECURE Act into it one way or the other. And then I want to get that off my plate because what I really want to talk about is charity. It's the, it's the last big topic, wealth management topic, that I haven't really – I've sort of hinted at it here and there. But I'd like to talk about it in, in uh, more detail because I've, I know I've given money to charity in my life. I just – I see how foolishly I've been with my donations and how they've basically amounted to very little versus what they could have done. And I've been smarter about it. So I want to atone for my sins. And so I want to write a book about how to be a more effective uh, giver when we do give to charity. I want to give you a chance to wrap this up a bit. Somewhere between twenty and 30,000 people will listen to this podcast in, in the next month after it's published. And then perhaps 1,000 a month after that going forward. So you've got the ear of a lot of doctors and other high-income professionals. What would you like to tell them that we haven't already covered in the podcast? I have a couple of books I would like to recommend to them, apart from uh, your book, which, of course, is a classic. But one would be – this is a political book, really. We all know Atul Gawande's book, The Checklist Manifesto. But I think The Checklist Manifesto of 2019 is going to be Marty Markery's book, The Price We Pay, which is about how to fix the healthcare system. I think that doctors are getting hurt by association with the healthcare system. You know, people are having lots of problems with it. And uh, while doctors, I've always revered doctors, and that's that was always the attitude growing up. You know, here, people are, seem to have a lower opinion of doctors these days. And I think doctors should get out in front of the uh, how to fix the healthcare system rather than just be bystanders while it gets fixed elsewhere. Especially if you don't, if you, I think that Medicare for All is going to be a big campaign idea. And if you think there's a better way of doing it, I think uh, Markery does, that I would get behind it. The other thing I want to say more uh, personally, financially, is this. Doctors live rich, but they don't die rich. Uh, they mistake having a big salary for wealth. And this is the problem. So you want to think about when you go to sleep at night, how can I transform this high salary into a form of wealth? How can I transform my practice into a business? That's the way that your family is going to benefit most. And, there, and a good book about this is uh, called The E-Myth by Michael Gerber. I would recommend that. All right. We've been talking to Phil DeMuth, PhD. He is the Managing Director of Conservative Wealth Management, the author of The Affluent Investor and The Overtaxed Investor, both books which I highly recommend. Thank you so much, Phil, for coming on the podcast today. Dr. Jim, thank you so much for having me. It's been great being here. That was great having Phil on. Like I said, he has a few controversial ideas and I dwelt a lot on those. But if you read his books and his writing, you'll realize that we agree on about 99% of everything financial. And so... Uh, it's just fun to talk about the controversial stuff. Make sure you're signed up for our email list. You can get that at whitecoatinvestor.com slash email. You can get the monthly newsletter. You can get a weekly summary of the blog posts. You can get every blog post we've published uh, directly in your email box. We're also starting a list for real estate investing opportunities and to learn more about that. That one's a little bit, uh, will feel a little bit more marketing-like than the main newsletter and the blog posts. 
But if you are interested in some of those private real estate opportunities, you can uh, sign up for that as well. And like anything, it's free and you can unsubscribe from it at any time. Thanks to those of you who are giving us a five-star review on the podcast and for telling all your friends about it. Those reviews really do help spread the word of physician financial literacy. Cindy back again. Check out this episode's show notes at whitecoatinvestor.com. You'll find a full transcription of this episode as well as links to everything that was discussed. This podcast was brought to you by Contract Diagnostics. This is a company that specializes in physician contract reviews. Specialization is something we can all appreciate here. So again, when you have contract needs, give them a call, even if it's to talk about your current compensation structure in the group you're in. They have helped many of your White Coat Investor colleagues. Check out contractdiagnostics.com or give them a call at 888-574-5526. Head up, shoulders back. We'll see you next time on the White Coat Investor Podcast.